Hello, everyone. This is the advanced section uh, by uh, Salvador on the computing with chemistry in the mini course of computation. And uh, Salvador, maybe you can first uh, briefly introduce yourself and then start your talk. Yeah, sure. I, I actually um, I have a little intro slide a few slides in, so I, I will I will get to that. Um, I, I'm just going to start my talk. So um, competing with chemistry. Um, yeah. You can see here we're going to take um, some representation of chemistry, probably not this particular representation, and build some representation of a computer, um, probably not this representation. But but that's that's sort of the idea. Um, so what do you think of when you think of chemical reactions? Um, possibly you think of some natural process, like here we have uh, oxidation, lots of elements on the ship being oxidized, maybe some iron rusting. Um, or maybe you think of um, some biological process like photosynthesis, um, which is in some ways the opposite of a process like this. Um, maybe you've taken some chemistry classes, and so you think of either of those processes in terms of chemical reactions, like um, iron rusting here, or, or like photosynthesis here. Um, or maybe you've taken some organic chemistry and you think of chemical reactions in terms of arrow pushing, um, or you've taken some biochemistry and you think of um, big networks of, of uh, metabolic reactions. Um, or perhaps you're a physicist and you think of chemical reactions in terms of um, molecular orbitals and, and energy diagrams, or you've taken some statistical mechanics and you think of um, reactions as counting microstates and macrostates and partition functions and, and all of those things. Um, so all of those are completely valid ways of thinking about chemical reactions. Um, but for today, I want you to ignore all of those specific ways of thinking about chemical reactions and just think about um, abstract chemical reactions. And, and abstract chemical reactions look like this. We have some list of um, reactants. Um, we don't need to assign particular real chemical identities to any of those reactants. We'll just call them A and B and C and D. Uh, we have some products. Um, I, again, we don't need to assign specific chemicals to those products. We just need to know they exist. And the reaction is happening at some rate K. Um, so what I want you to take away from this lecture is that chemistry, chemical reactions like that sort of reaction are capable of performing some computations. Um, in order to understand how that happens, we need to come up with some descriptions of how these systems behave. Um, and I'm going to introduce two models for chemical reactions. Um, reactions occurring in bulk, and I'll show you how those are capable of computing analog functions. Um, a different model of reactions called stochastic reactions, which are capable of computing digital functions. Um, and then at the end, I'll show you how we can take some of these abstract descriptions of chemical reactions and convert them into DNA molecules um, to enable us to perform these computations in real life. Um, so why would you want to do this? Why would you want to compete with chemistry? Um, I, I think there are two compelling reasons. One is um, biology is, is really an instance of, of chemistry. And so I, I think by looking at chemistry from this computational perspective, we can get insights into natural processes, in, including a lot of biological processes. Um, and we can also look at it from the other perspective, from the synthetic perspective, that understanding um, how to program with these molecular reactions can allow us to um, build some, some quite powerful systems. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a second year PhD student at Caltech. I work with um, Eric Winfrey in what he calls the natural algorithms group. Um, and so it's, it's a, a group of us who are interested in um, looking at an, an algorithmic or a, a computational perspective on chemistry. Um, I did my undergrad in chemistry. Um, at the time, I didn't think of chemistry as a computational model. Um, that's, that's really a, a change in my mindset over the last couple of years. Um, and then I, I did a master's in, in systems or, or computational biology um, at, at Cambridge as well. Um, and so some of the, the questions that I'm interested in and, and that I work on in Eric's group are, are things like, um, how does a living cell arise from a mixture of inert chemicals? Um, how does an organism arise from just a single cell? What sorts of computational models capture the power of the cell? The, the cell is capable of doing 
all sorts of things. How, how can we understand what it's doing? Um, and potentially could life look very different from biology? Yeah, okay, so let's get into it. Um, I showed you this slide before. This is just to remind you that this is the type of reaction that we'll be considering today, these abstract reactions, where we just have some reactants, some products, and a rate that the reactants are converted to products. Um, so a, a couple of key terms. Um, we can describe reactions as being uni unimolecular, um, bimolecular, or catalytic. Um, potentially, you could have trimolecular or, or, or even higher order reactions. Um, and you'll notice that um, when I'm describing um, these reactions, I, I'm just counting the number of species on the left-hand side of the arrow, so, so the number of reactants. And there's a reason for that, which I'll get to. Um, and what I mean by catalytic reaction is that at least one of the reactants is not consumed in the reaction. Um, so here you can see that A appears on, on both sides. And so this reaction isn't going to change how much of A is present in the system. Um, so why focus on reactants rather than um, products? Um, and the reason for this is that it's the reactants that determine the rate at which the, re at, at which the reactions happen. And you need to know the rates that reactions happen so that you can produce dynamical models, so you can produce models of, of how the system evolves over time. Um, so with a reaction like this, where we're now saying that we have some number of molecules of A, some number of molecules of B reacting together, to produce some number of molecules of C and some number of molecules of D, um, where all of those numbers are integers, um, we can say that the rate of the reaction is just this rate constant times the concentration of A to the power of alpha times the concentration of B to the power of beta. Um, and here the rate is defined as per, per mole of reaction or per unit of reaction. So as in um, R, an R of one would be um, alpha of A and beta of B going to gamma of C and delta of D. Um, where does this come from? Um, there are a few different ways of looking at it. Um, it, it. It's found empirically to work very well. And you can derive, um, if, if you make some assumptions, you can also derive equations like this from statistical mechanics. Um, but today we're just going to take it for granted that, um, that this model, which is called mass action kinetics, describes the rates of reactions. Oh, sorry um, to interrupt, Salvador. Yeah. Let me just make sure I understand correctly. So the rate here means that the rate of like a, like a, this reaction. So it's like a speed of uh, this re reaction. Yes, exactly. The, the speed that this reaction happens at. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to be even more specific mm -hmm. than that. This AB will also change. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So to be more specific, th this is the rate at which, uh, th this is the rate at which the reaction is happening. Um, but we can convert that into thinking about how um, the concentration of all of these um, reactants and products are changing. Um, so we can see that as one unit of this reaction happens, um, alpha molecules of A are being consumed. And so the concentration of A is decreasing at a rate of um, alpha times the, the overall reaction rate. And, and similarly for beta, whereas um, the products are being synthesized, not consumed. And so the concentration of, ga of um, C is increasing at a rate of, of gamma times the overall rate. And, and similarly for D, that, that's increasing at a rate of delta times the, the overall rate. Um, so as an example for that, if we have this um, simp uh, simple reaction where two molecules of A are being converted into one molecule of B at rate five, um, the, the, the rate of change of A is going to be, you, you can see that we have this squared um, dependence on the, the concentration of A here, and that comes from this. Um, you can see that we have um, uh, uh, an, a rate constant of five, which is just going to, to multiply um, here. And you can see that one reaction is consuming two units of A, so we have a minus two here, whereas it's producing one unit of B, so we have just a, a plus one here. Um, and so if, if we simulate this, we graph the concentration of A over time, you can see that it, it follows this nice um, one over a uh, or what one over t um, function, which which is what you'd obtain if if you solve this differential equation. Um, so the final piece of the puzzle before we see how we can use um, chemical reactions to compute is this notion of chemical reaction networks. So we we can think of um, these reactions uh, happening independently 
or we can um, hook up, connect a bunch of reactions together where you have some elements appearing um, multiple times over. So, so here you can see um, C is being produced in this reaction. It's being consumed in this reaction. And this reaction is consuming the products of the first reaction and the second reaction to produce some output molecule. Um, I, I don't know if this particular reaction network does anything interesting, but this is just an example. Um, OK, but so perhaps surprisingly, those components are already enough to compute algebraic functions. Um, so for instance, we can have, um, uh, yeah, uh, if, if we represent um, numbers by the concentrations of the species that are present in our chemical reaction network, we can do computations like um, setting the concentration of one molecule equal to the sum of the concentrations of two others, um, equal to the square of another, equal to the square root of another, whatever. Um, a couple of conventions here are that the inputs aren't consumed during this computational process, so they, they just stay at steady state. Um, and we achieve that by making the inputs catalytic in all of the reactions. Um, and the concentration of the output converges to this desired value over time. So we, we, we're going to set up our system, and we're going to see that if we let it run forever, um, that eventually the concentration of the output should converge to um, some function of, of the concentrations of the inputs. Um, so for an example, if we, if we want to perform addition with chemical reactions, so say we want to set the concentration of C um, to be the sum of the concentrations of, of A and B, um, all we need to do for that is these three reactions here. So the first reaction, um, A is catalytically creating C at rate of one. And I say catalytic because you can see that A appears on both sides. It's, it's not being consumed by the reaction. Um, the reaction for B looks very similar. Um, B is, is catalytically producing C. Um, and then C is going to this symbol here, the empty set symbol um, at a rate of one. And all this means is C is being consumed or, or destroyed or it's sometimes um, called annihilated. Um, so why, why is this chemical reaction network computing this sum? Um, so we can write down um, differential equations or uh, de time derivatives for the concentrations of A and B, but they won't be very interesting because um, they're not being produced or consumed in these reactions so that they're just not going to change in concentration. Um, and so their concentration is going to, for the entire trajectory of the reaction, stay at whatever the initial concentration is. Um, but for C, which is the output the species we're interested in, we can see that this reaction is going to produce C at a rate of um, 1 times A. This reaction is going to produce C at a rate of 1 times B. And this reaction is going to um, consume C at a rate of just C, 1 times C. Um, so if we write down um, that differential equation, we can say that the rate of change of C is just plus A to, uh, plus B minus C. Um, and at steady state, um, so it, at, at the, the limit of, um, the, the limit of uh, infinity, um, this, is, this is going to converge to, um, uh, if, if it, so, so another way of saying that is if we set this time derivative to zero, um, that that's what the reaction is going to converge to. And um, we'll have A plus B minus C is equal to zero. And another way of saying that is that C is equal to A plus B. And so we can see that um, as we wanted, the concentration of C is going to end up as the sum of these two concentrations. Um, and if we simulate that system, uh, here is it's just a simple mathematical simulation. Um, we can see that we start off with a concentration of A, at two, uh, B at three, we start off with no um, C. You can see that as we desired, the concentrations of A and B aren't changing over time. And the concentration of C does indeed um, converge to, to five, which is two plus three. Um, okay, so another example, multiplication. Uh, this is actually even a, a simpler reaction network. It just includes two reactions. Um, here we have A plus B are producing C together. And again, it's catalytic. Um, you're not consuming A or B in this reaction. And again, um, C is being consumed at a rate of one. Um, and so now we can see that the rate of this reaction, each, each unit of this reaction is going to produce one molecule of C. The rate constant is one. 
And so the, the rate of this reaction for C is just going to be um, the concentration of A times the concentration of B. The rate of consumption of C here is just going to be C. And so again, the differential equation here is um, A times B minus C. So at steady state, um, we're going to have C is equal to A times B. Cool. Um, and yeah, again, we can simulate that and it behaves pretty much like we would expect it to. A and B aren't changing and C is converging to six. Um, so I, I could keep doing this sort of ad nauseam. Um, here, um, we will work backwards. Um, I'm going to show how, if you take some um, algebraic function, you might think about obtaining a reaction network. Um, so we want C to compute the square root of something. Um, another way of saying that is we want, yeah, C is, is equal to the square root of um, the initial concentration of A. Um, how are we going to find this? So we can square both sides and say that um, C squared at the convergence limit is equal to A. Um, so at steady state, um, DC by DT is equal to zero. And so we know that um, we want DC by DT to, to be equal to A minus C squared. And what reaction looks like that? Well. It's got a positive. Um, it's got a positive one times a term, so we're, we're going to have a producing c at a rate of one, and it's got a negative um, c squared term. So we need consumption of um, consumption of c um, in this bimolecular reaction. And and remember that um, if you have a bimolecular reaction, um, the coefficient here becomes the exponent here. Um, but each of these reactions is going to consume two units of c. Um, but we don't have a factor of two here. And so we introduce this factor of a half, um, which multiplied by the two just becomes one. And, and so, um, yeah, then this reaction is going to have the kinetics that we're looking for. Um, and if we simulate that, um, again, we can see that, um, yeah, we, we can set A to different concentrations. Here, we set A to four and we can see C converges to two. Here we set A as equal to 0.25 and we could see that um, C converges to 0.5. Um, so can, can you compute all um, functions like this? Unfortunately, no. Um, so one function, a type of function that you definitely can't compute is functions that don't have smooth derivatives um, and functions that don't converge. You, you, can, you can simulate the evolution of some functions that don't converge, but you can't um, directly compute them using these sorts of modules. Um, e to the x is a function which does converge uh, for all x. You know, for, for a given x, we can just write down um, some number. But unfortunately, we can't calculate what that number is um, for an arbitrary x using uh, chemical reaction networks. Um, so, so there's nothing in a chemical reaction network that looks like this exponentiation. That, that doesn't really appear in, in the rate laws. Um, in principle, that's, that's fine. Um, because a lot of functions, including e to the x, we can approximate um, using Maclaurin series or Tate Taylor series or Maclaurin series. And you can see that um, using the modules that we've built so far, that any one of these um, terms, we could um, find some reaction which obeys the kinetics like that. Um, but the issue is that we would need an infinite number of these to um, get uh, um, a good approximation for e to the x. Um, we, we could approximate it over some range. So if, if we only care about um, you know, x being smaller than some number, perhaps we don't need um, an infinite number of these terms in order to get a good approximation for x. Um, but yes, in, in, in the general case, we can't compute this function using um, chemical reaction networks. Um, I have a lot more to say about uh, bulk chemical reaction networks. and um, I don't know how the timing for this is going to go, um, but if we have time at the end, I um, am very happy to go through how we can do things like represent um, negative numbers and negative reaction rates. Um, I'm happy to show you how we can stack some of those um, basic modules together um, to, to compute more complicated functions like the quadratic formula. And I'm also happy to show how we can do something like build a neural network out of chemical reactions um, where a neural, a neural network is really just um, some series of weighted sums and then a function applied to the, the output of that weighted sum. Um, so yeah, please ask me about those at the end if you're interested. Um, 
So, yeah. So, so maybe I, I have a quick question. Yes. So, I mean, so now I have a much better sense on the broader picture, especially the theoretical framework. But I'm also curious, like in practice, if people want to really do this, like how many chemicals like or like re reactants should I expect is uh, realizable, like uh, hundreds, thousands, or even more? Or it's like oh, in, in you mean oh, in principle, how how big of systems can you build? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So so, so people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so at the end, I, I just have a couple of slides on DNA computing. Um, and the reason why people um, uh, use DNA to approach questions like this is that um, it's generally possible to take some abstract um, chemical reaction network and find some set of DNA molecules which can implement that, that oh. reaction network. And people have actually built um, uh, DNA reaction networks consisting of, of thousands of different types of DNA strands. So, so you, you can actually build quite big systems. Um, yeah, th those, those systems have, um, like uh, the, the lab that I'm in has constructed a type of neural network out of DNA, which, which had about a thousand components. Oh, I see, I see. Well, very in impressive, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you, you sometimes have to change, um, you sometimes have to change your reaction a little bit in order to get a good compilation to DNA. So for instance, you, you can see that this reaction, although it obeys the formalisms of this abstract reaction theory, um, you can kind of see that maybe physically speaking, we're just producing this C out of nothing, right? So, so that's a little bit strange. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we would need to do to, to produce that in, in, in practice is we probably need on, on the left-hand side here, to have some additional molecule, we normally call it a, a fuel molecule that just powers the reaction and is consumed. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd have some fuel that reacts with A catalytically to re release C. And if we keep the concentration of C uh, of the fuel fixed, so if, if we find some way of just keeping that at a, a steady state concentration, then um, the kinetics won't be significantly changed by that we'd be multiplying the rate by some constant. And so we can just reduce the rate constant by the equivalent amount and then get the same kinetics in terms of C. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no worries. Um, oh, uh, so there's also questions in the chat saying, so Bing asked, can you uh, explain the empty set reaction again? Oh, yeah. Um, so actually that was, that appears on here as well. Yeah. So the, um, the empty set reaction, um, just means that, um, whatever species is reacting is being consumed. Um, so it's, it's going to, to disappear out of the reaction network. Um, and again, if we were to do that in, in real life, probably the way that you do that is you have some other molecule here that, um, reacts very strongly with, um, the, the molecule that you're trying to annihilate and it produces some complex that's not reactive with any of the other molecules. So, so you can think of that reaction as just removing this molecule from um, the, the, the rest of the, re the, the system of reactions. Um, so it's, it's just a way of, yeah, reducing the concentration of, of whatever molecule you're, you're talking about. Were there, were there other questions in the chat? I think that's probably, and also CJ mentioned, asked a little bit about like the direction. Are we only care about one oh, direction? Yeah. Um, so, so there are models of um, chemical react. That, that's a good question. There are models of chemical reactions um, that consider reactions happening in both directions. And so you consider the energetics of, of the reaction. Those reactions are called um, detailed balance. Um, or, or the, the, those, those, those sorts of models are called detailed balance models. And it's possible to do computations with, with um, those models as well. Um, but here we're considering a, a simpler model where um, just the forwards reaction is, is happening. Or if we really want to introduce the reverse reaction, we can just write down another reaction that points in the other direction. And, and so in, in principle, you can still get um, that correct Boltzmann distribution by just setting the forwards rate and the reverse rate appropriately. Um, but, but yeah, you, you can think of these reactions as just being, um, you know, infinite energy change. So they, they just happen in, in one direction, but yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so 
Yes, the, the last thing that I want to say about these bulk reactions, because it connects to the next section on stochastic reactions, is that um, in it, you, you can do lots of things. Like, like I said, in addition to um, computing algebraic functions, you can um, produce dynamical systems. And so here is um, quite a, a, a simple type of dynamical system just involving um, two different types of, um, two, two different species. I'm calling them uh, the predator and the prey species. Um, and, uh, but here I've described them as particular predator and a particular prey. And you can see that um, the first reaction, a fox is eating a rabbit and is using that to make another fox. Um, in the second reaction, a rabbit is reproducing to make two rabbits. Um, and in the third reaction, the foxes are just dying at some rate. Um, and uh, this simulation here is using um, these rate constants that I've written here. Um, but you can set these rate constants differently, or you can set the initial concentrations differently. And you will get something that looks kind of similar to this, but um, perhaps with different heights of peaks or uh, different frequencies of oscillation or, or different lags between the two peaks or whatever. But you can see that the dy dynamics essentially are that um, when the foxes become low in, in population, that allows the rabbits to grow exponentially. Um, but the foxes, um, as the rabbits get, um, as, as the population of rabbits increases, um, that allows foxes to eat the rabbits and make more foxes. So the foxes also grow exponentially. But as the foxes grow, they're eating the rabbits, so the rabbits are shrinking. Um, and eventually, the fox population shrinks as well. Um, but you can see, and, and the really important thing here is that um, because of how we've constructed this system of differential equations, um, neither population can ever go to zero. Both of the populations can become arbitrarily low, but still recover. Um, so the next model um, that I want to introduce is what are called stochastic reactions. Um, and this allows us to do a, a different type of computation um, using digital logic. Um, and so the, the really core difference here is that um, instead of thinking about um, all of these species in terms of concentrations, we now think of them in terms of counts of molecules. So, so we're imagining some particular volume that the reaction is happening in. And there is just some finite number of um, each of those molecules in that reaction volume. Um, and so we, we call that a count. Um, the reactions can still happen in the same way. So we can still have uh, alpha of A reacting with beta of B giving gamma of C and producing delta of D um, at some rate K. Um, but this reaction, rather than now considering um, one mole of this reaction uh, consuming alpha moles uh, and beta moles, we're now thinking of these reactions as individual events happening one at a time, where we're consuming literally alpha molecules of A and beta molecules of B and producing gamma molecules of C and, and delta of D. Um, and so rather than talking about the rates of reactions, we instead talk about the propensity of reactions. Um, so we say that the, pretend, um, the propensity of this reaction, you can see that the form is still similar. Um, it it's still is proportional to the rate constant, and it's still proportional to, um, uh, I'm, I'm calling it here, QA for the count of A to the power of alpha and QB to the, the power of beta. Um, yeah, and in the next couple of slides, I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so why are we calling it a propensity and not a rate? Um, so this is a stochastic model. For some set of um, counts of, 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 of these reactants, um, some set of reactions are possible. We choose one of those reactions randomly. When, when we model the system, we randomly choose one of those reactions according to the probability that it occurs. And so if a reaction has a higher rate or if um, it has a higher concentration uh, count of reactants, it's more likely to occur than some other reaction with a lower rate or lower concentrations of reactions, of reactants. Um, and so we can just make some, if, if we have a list of all of the reactions that we're modeling, we can um, use this formula to produce a propensity for each of the reactions. And just as we model the system over time, we choose a reaction to occur um, proportional to the propensity that that reaction happens at. Um, and so why is this proportional to um, this term here? rather than um, equal to. 
Um, so today we're ignoring the reaction volume. Um, there should really be uh, divided by V here, um, but I, it, it doesn't really add anything to understanding the dynamics. Um, so then what's going on with this definition of exponentiation? Um, so the, the really core idea here is that a reaction can only happen if there are enough molecules for it to happen. Um, that's really the key difference from the bulk model. And it allows the rates of some reactions to become exactly zero when there aren't any of those molecules present. Um, and so for example, if you had, um, if you had this reaction here, where um, two of A are being converted to one of A. Um, in this bulk case, we can see that the rate of this reaction is just A squared. And so again, if, if we graph that, that looks like this one over T decay. But you can see that, um, so, so here it's graphed for the first five time units, here for the first hundred, and here for the first thousand. Um, if we zoom in um, right at the end, um, we've zoomed in here and we've zoomed in here, we can see that the concentration of A is just reducing forever. It, it's getting arbitrarily low, but it's never going to get to zero. Whereas if we're modeling in terms of the number of counts, you can see that the shape of the curve is similar. It still roughly looks like um, one over T, but when we get down to just one molecule of A being present, the propensity of this reaction will be um, one times one minus one, which is zero. And so there's zero propensity for this reaction. This reaction can't occur. And that makes sense, right? This reaction, if we think about it, rather than in this more abstract way, if, if we think about it in, in terms of actual molecules, it's saying that two molecules of A have to collide and one of them is somehow being consumed. And so if there's only one molecule of A present, it can't happen. Um, and so the reaction system will just stop here. Um, oh, uh, just a, sorry to interrupt, a quick intuitive uh, question. So is that a case that for bulk reaction, it is more like a thinking of the world is continuous, so you can keep like uh, going down and going down. The, the, yes. And here, stochastic model actually is more quantized. Yes, yeah. that, that's right. And, mm -hmm. and so, so actually, a lot of the time, um, this model is appropriate. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the sorts of reactions that you do in a chemistry lab, you're, you're moving um, you know, volumes of, of liquid act that you can see at concentrations um, you know, that might be molar or, or millimolar or, or whatever. Um, but the, the key is that um, Avogadro's number is so big um, that the number of molecules that participate in those sorts of reactions is so high that you can think of it as really being continuous. We're, we're talking about you know, order of 10 to the, the 20 molecules or whatever, which is, is just high enough that um, you can model it using these sorts of kinetics without really losing anything. Um, but in biological systems, the volumes that we're talking about there, the volumes of, of cells like a, a bacterial cell are so small. It's, uh, you know, a bacterial cell is about a cubic micrometer. So we're talking of a, a volume of about 10 to the, the minus 18 um, meters cubed. Um, and, and the concentrations of some of these molecules are so low, we're talking about nanomolar concentrations, that there really are just order one or order 10 of, of a lot of these key molecules in a cell. And so a lot of the time when we're thinking about reactions happening in a biological context, this sort of stochastic modeling is really necessary. And it's, um, it doesn't make sense to talk about these numbers as being continuous. Um, so as a, a more interesting example of, of how you can get very different dynamics when you, when you think about these reactions um, stochastically rather than in bulk is that um, uh, in these predator-prey systems, um, the number of foxes, because the foxes are just dying at some rate, the foxes actually can go to exactly zero. And so you can see um, that that's happened in um, these three simulations here, is that the foxes have gone to, to exactly zero at some time, which allows the rabbits to just grow exponentially. Here, we didn't even get a single oscillation. The, the, the foxes just went straight to zero. And you can see that by the end of the simulation, there were 800,000 rabbits. Um, here, we got a couple of um, decent looking oscillations, but the foxes went to zero. Um, here, you can see that we've had two decent oscillations, one very noisy oscillation. Um, and if we simulated this for long enough, 
eventually the foxes would go to zero. Um, but you can see that the, the dynamics here are very different to the dynamics in the um, the bulk case. Um, it's in maybe at the beginning we get something that looks a little bit similar, but it becomes um, qualitatively different because you have these extinction events. Um, one 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 on the other species is going to zero. Oh, so um, just to clarify, I understand correctly. So are all these four all use the same reactions? Yes, yeah, they, they, oh, they're so using the same reactions that they're just different, um, different it, it, because you're randomly choosing which reaction happens. Ah, right, right. Um, yeah, when, when you model these systems, they, 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 um, each run will look different from another run. It's quite surprising that it can be a case that the, the prey becomes so large, but there's no prey to take. Yes, uh, I mean, so a, a more nuanced model might have something like in order to grow, the prey has to consume, um, it's a rabbit, so maybe it has to consume grass or something. And you start out with some fixed supply of grass, which falls, and then it probably can't grow unbounded. But yeah, uh, I should have had that reaction. But yes, um, you can see that if the foxes go to zero, the only, so this, if the foxes are at zero, this reaction can't happen, this uh, reaction can't happen. So the only reaction can happen is this. And so the, the, the rabbits are just growing exponentially. I see, I see. That makes sense. Just um, yes. So if, if you're looking at a simulation like this, you might think, um, OK, stochastic chemical reactions are probably just worse than bulk chemical reactions. They, they look really noisy. Um, they're not deterministic. Um, what can we do with them that's interesting? Um, so I would say that if you use them correctly, they actually have a lot of power that bulk reactions don't happen. Um, and the key is there that if we want to do something involving binary variables, um, in a bulk reaction, we'd only really be able to encode binary variables with high versus low concentrations, which is error prone. Um, if, if you're constructing digital logic and you're saying that um, I have some species, you know, you want to perform an, an AND gate or something, um, uh, you have two species, um, when both of those species are at a high concentration, you should produce some output. But when either is at a low concentration, you shouldn't produce some output. But when they're at a low concentration, they're still present. And so you might still be producing some small amount of your output. Um, and so it's actually, there are some ways that you can get around this um, using things like signal restoration and, and thresholding and, and whatever. But in general, it's error prone to try to um, build and model binary systems using these bulk reactions. Um, but in stochastic systems, we actually have molecules being present or absent. Um, and so we can encode binary variables by their presence or absence, which is much more robust. Um, and so to give just one illustration of this, um, stochastic chemical reaction networks can actually simulate Turing machines. Um, so if we think back to Qining's um, first couple of lectures, um, we can remember that a Turing machine consists of um, some tape. Um, at each cell on the tape, you have some symbol which belongs to a finite alphabet. So here we just have 0, 1, and B. Um, you have a state which has, uh, you have a head which has some state. Here it's uh, Q1. Um, and it can read what's written on the tape um, and depending on its state and depending on what it reads, it can write something to the tape and it can move left or right. Um, and the rules governing that are some finite list of transition rules, which I'm writing like this, um, which just says that if the state is in QI, and here it's reading zero, um, then it transitions to state QJ, it writes a one, and it moves um, plus one. So, so here that's going to be to the right. Um, so how can we encode that in a chemical reaction network? Um, reactions are happening in a well-mixed liquid. What does it mean to talk about a tape? Um, and so here we cheat a little bit, and we say that um, each of these, we imagine numbering each of the cells in this tape. Um, and so then we can construct species that look something like this. If we have um, a symbol alpha at the tape position N, we'll just call that alpha N. Um, and so for example, if we had a tape like this, we have a zero at position one, zero at position two, one at position three, zero at position four, and B at position five. 
we would write that as um, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 3, 0, 4, B5, and so on. Um, and so if we have the starting conditions of exactly one of these, um, exactly one count of each of these species at each position on the tape, and we have only one um, single tape molecule, uh, head molecule, um, at whatever position we care about and in whatever starting state we wanted to have, then we can write all of these transition rules just as reactions like this. Um, so yeah, to, to reiterate, we have um, a transition rule on the left for a regular Turing machine, um, which just says that if the head is in state QI and it's reading an alpha, it writes, it becomes, uh, it transitions to state QJ, it writes a beta and it moves plus one. Um, we can write that as this reaction. So if the um, state, if the head is in um, uh, state I at position N, it can only react with other molecules also present at um, position N. Um, and so we can write this particular transition as the head in state I at position N would react with an alpha at position N to produce a beta position n, which is another way of saying that we're changing the symbol that's written on the tape. And the head state changes to j at n plus 1. So it can now react with whatever's present at n plus 1. And because we only have um, one molecule of the head present at the beginning, and this, and this reaction is only is consuming that molecule of the head and producing the molecule of the head in a different state, we're only, like in the Turing machine, we're only ever going to have one head. Um, because we have this indexing here, the head can only ever react with um, molecules that correspond to some particular cell on the tape, which means that we can only ever have one reaction happening at a time. And we can write the transition rules for um, the head moving by changing the index here and for reading and writing to the tape by changing what it reacts with and what it produces. Um, so that was that was a lot, but hopefully that made sense. Um, I would say that in order to, um, to 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 convert to this model, we have to bite one of two bullets. Um, one is that uh, one possibility is that we have um, so, okay. Sorry, I I, I should say um, for clarity that this means that you need to um, define. Um, n number of, of species, um, and you have to define n number of reactions. Um, they, they'll only have um, a finite number of types, um, but you could potentially have, so, so if, if your two symbols are, say, alpha and beta, you'd have to have alpha and beta 1, alpha and beta 2, alpha and beta 3, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have just one transition rule like this, you'd have to define this transition rule for um, uh, cell 1, for cell 2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which means that because a Turing machine potentially has an infinite tape, it has an indefinitely extensible tape, then potentially you have an infinite number of um, different species and an infinite number of different reactions. There will be a finite types, but an infinite number of them. Um, and so that is a violation of um, one of the definitions of a Turing machine, which says that the alphabet and the, the um, list of transition rules should be finite. Um, the other way, um, and if we actually wanted to build one of these systems in real life, this is what we would do, is say that we're going to bound the tape. We're going to say that n can just vary up to some number. Um, that won't be a universal Turing machine. There will be some functions that that Turing machine couldn't compute. But for a lot of the functions we care about, um, a, a tape of fixed length is fine. Um, and so in, in reality, that's the bullet we would normally choose to bite. Um, so there's a lot more to say about stochastic chemical reaction networks as well. Um, I introduced um, the stochastic chemical reaction network simulation of a Turing machine to um, motivate the idea that this is a powerful universal model of computation. Um, but as with um, uh, computer science in general, often, although you can prove that a model of computation is Turing complete, if you want to practically do something with this model, you are not going to simulate a Turing machine with this model because that's likely going to be an extremely inefficient way of solving your problem. Um, 
And so to give an example of something that um, stochastic chemical reaction networks can do quite efficiently, um, I think that stochastic local search and um, a good example of that is graph coloring um, is something that they can do very well. There's actually quite a, a short um, chemical reaction network that you can write down that can color a graph if it's colorable. And so I'm, I'm happy to do that um, at the end if anyone is interested. Um, so finally, I have just a couple of slides on DNA computing. Um, I think that the real idea here is that we've been talking a lot about, I, I've, I've sort of introduced this idea, but we've been talking about um, chemical reactions in this very abstract way. Um, DNA computing sounds weird, um, but the core idea here is that a lot of the time we can take some abstract chemical reaction and we can find um, a set of DNA molecules that actually allows us to run that reaction in real life. Um, so we're using DNA as a computational substrate. Um, and, and that's a very different way to how biology uses DNA. So, so biology uses DNA to um, transcribe it into mRNA and then use that mRNA to build proteins. We're not doing that here. Um, what we're doing here has, has really nothing to do with, with proteins or, or how biology uses DNA. The, the, the core idea um, is that we understand DNA base pairing very well. Um, we can design and, and chemically synthesize DNAs with um, pretty much arbitrary sequences. So we, we can just write down um, some list of, of, of bases and then send that to a company and they will print the DNA and they'll send us back a test tube which has DNA with that sequence in. Um, which means that we're able to design DNA strands that can bind to particular other strands. Um, and the rate, uh, particular other strands which are complementary to, to, to that strand. Um, and the rate that that happens at just depends on the amount of overlap. So, so if, if two strands are complementary but overlap only by a little bit, they're going to bind together quite slowly and quite reversibly. If they, buy, if they overlap by a lot, then they're going to, to bind together quite strongly and quite quickly. Um, and so this is quite an abstract way of looking at DNA. We don't really care about the specific sequences because we're not using it to build a protein. We just care about having these domains of DNA which can interact with each other in these um, reliable and programmable ways. Um, and, and really the only types of um, reactions that are actually happening with the DNA are just these binding, unbinding, and displacing reactions. Um, and so there's this fantastic paper here, which I realized I should have given a reference for, um, which shows how you can use um, just these three types of reactions to produce um, any logic gate that you can think of, which means that you can, um, uh, again, produce Boolean circuits, which are a, a universal model of computation. So, so you can use um, yeah, the, the, just these, these simple DNA reactions to build any circuit that, that you care to. Um, and so the, these equations that I've written here um, are just descriptions of um, what's happening diagrammatically here. And so the idea here is that um, you can see this um, blue squiggly line, it's referred to as a toehold. Um, that's going to bind to this complementary blue squiggly line pointing the other direction. Um, because there's not much overlap, this is going to happen not particularly quickly. But when that happens, um, strand A, so, so that, that's a binding reaction. Um, when that happens, uh, strand A is going to bind here to strand I. Um, and then because strand A is complementary to, to, to this, uh, to strand I, it's going to actually reversibly kick off strand C. Um, and um, that, that, that's going to happen just as a random walk. There's really no, nothing that favors one or the other. Um, but because when strand C leaves, there's no way for strand C to get back on, um, this reaction is going to be irreversible. It can only, it can only happen in this direction. Um, whereas if strand C, if, if we change what the complex looks like and we put a toehold, a different toehold on this side, um, and we give strand C a toehold as well, then you can see that um, this half of the reaction is going to be similar. Um, A's toehold is going to bind to this toehold here and is going to kick off strand C, but that now exposes this toehold here. 
which strand C can bind back to and can again reversibly uh, can, can kick off um, A, which means that this reaction can happen in, in both directions. Um, and it turns out actually that, yeah, just, just these types of um, uh, reversible and irreversible um, strand displacement reactions are enough to build logic gates. Um, I think I won't go into this. The, the, this is, I, I won't explain this in detail, but this is an example of um, uh, a DNA implementation of the predator prey system that I was talking about before. So you can say, uh, you can see here that we have um, this, this is uh, the prey, the predator, uh, yeah, the prey grow, the prey is labeled as N. It's growing catalytically here. So, so overall we have N going to 2N. Um, here the prey is being consumed to produce two predators. And here the predator is, is dying. Um, and, and this is just a, a DNA implementation of, of that system of reactions. Um, and when you, when you build that in real life, as, as, as has been done, um, you actually can get um, these. So, so, so here they're not doing it just in a, a well-mixed test tube. They're actually letting it happen on a surface. And you can see um, those waves uh, here just spreading across the surface in one direction. This is, um, we're starting off sort of with, with nothing. Um, the prey is initialized here and it grows in this wave across um, the, the, the dish. And it's followed by a wave of predator, which consumes the prey. But then after the prey has been consumed, the predator dies, and that allows the prey to recover. Um, and it produces these, these nice patterns when you let that happen in space. Um, so to, to sum up everything that I've said, um, what I really hope that you take away from this is that um, we can compute with chemistry, and life biology probably does compute with chemistry. Um, Abstract chemical reactions are a, a formal um, way of thinking about chemical reactions. Um, there are lots of different descriptions of abstract reactions, and I've, I've, I've just introduced two of them today, but th there are more models. Um, bulk reactions allow us to compute analog functions. Um, stochastic reactions, you might initially think of them as just noisy versions of bulk reactions, but in fact, they allow us to compute digital logic. Um, and DNA computing allows us to take these abstract reactions and find real chemicals which are capable of implementing those reactions. Um, so why would you care about this? Why would you want to do any of this? Um, I think there are a number of reasons. You might do this for scientific reasons. Um, so I, I, I think that um, a lot of these abstract reactions are actually good descriptions for some of the processes that happen in biology. Um, and a process that I'm particularly interested in is, is pattern formation. And, and my research is, is trying to produce some abstract chemical models of pattern formation. Um, you might want to do this for, for technological reasons. So you, you might want to do this to um, uh, control chemical synthesis. You might want to do this to control the behaviors of cells. So you can imagine some of these DNA computers um, computing actual functions inside cells. And that's something that people really do, um, you know, a, a sort of sci-fi example of what that might look like is maybe you um, modify one of your immune cells, you, you embed one of these computers into one of your immune cells so that you, it can execute a logic that looks like if I detect this particular type of bacteria, then I activate this um, uh, program which synthesizes an antibiotic or, or, or something like that. Um, and then maybe for a combination of scientific and technological reasons, um, rather than just studying biological systems, maybe we can make um, synthetic systems from the ground up that resemble those living systems in, in some ways. And, and, and that field of research is, is called artificial life. Um, so I, I think that um, it can sound weird to be computing with chemistry or with DNA, but there are strong reasons why you might want to do that. Yeah, so yeah, let's uh, thank uh, Salvador for the, the amazing talk. Yeah, like on um, computing with chemistry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I learned so much. Like uh, it actually really changed my, my, my mind a lot. Yeah, like it's like a totally new paradigm for me to thinking about computing, actually. I'm, I'm really happy because I, I, I had... Um... I had a very similar experience when I started thinking about 
chemistry as a, a computational model. I, I really had previously just thought of it as, um, you know, may, maybe a description of some natural processes or, or maybe something that we can use to make um, drugs or, or things that are useful for us. But I, I think this is, yeah, quite a different way of thinking about it. Mm, yes. Yes, I do have several questions, but uh, if people have some question, maybe you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask first. Okay, if no, then- Can you then actually- no. so, Oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, no, go Can ahead. you actually go over some of your, the, uh, you know, like the graph, the color, graph coloring? Oh, yeah, yeah, those things. Yeah. yeah. I just want to see some, you know, like, implementations yes i will um uh i will share my ipad screen uh just one second i need the cable um this this really this should take just uh a couple of minutes no problem Uh, can you see my iPad? Um, yes. So yeah, the, the idea here um, is that if we think of some graph that we want to color, um, so, so yeah, the problem of graph coloring is, is we just have some graph, um, which is a collection of, of nodes connected together by some edges. And the problem is we want to assign colors to the edges, uh, colors to the nodes, um, so that two nodes which are connected by an edge don't have the same color. So, so this would be an, an invalid graph coloring because, because um, these two nodes are connected together uh, by an edge, but they have the same color. Um, whereas this would be a, a valid coloring um, because all of the nodes are colored differently. Um, and so all, all we need to do to define um, a stochastic chemical reaction network which can color a graph is if we call each of these nodes, um, say this is N1, and at the moment it's colored red, this is N2, and it's colored blue, and this is N3, and it's colored green, um, all we need to do is for every pair of nodes that are connected by an edge, we need to define a reaction that looks like this. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to, um, for example, consider nodes one and two. Um, so node one plus node two, if they're colored the same way, so for instance, if they're both colored red, then we want to have a reaction which uncolors one of them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to choose to uncolor node two. And then, and, and we want to define this um, for, for all of the colors. We'd want to define it for red, green, and blue, or, or maybe you have more colors. Um, and then for the uncolored node, um, and, and you want to define it for all um, pairs of edges. So, so here it's just, I've given one and two as an example. Um, then for the uncolored nodes, so N2 uncolored, but again, you'd want to define this for all of the nodes, um, you randomly recolor it, which just means that you produce, um, you have three reactions, um, all of which happen at the same rate, which means the same probability. Um, and they recolor it to one of the different colors. Uh, that should say green. Um, so, so long as you have conflicts like this, one node is randomly going to be uncolored. Um, that node is then randomly going to be recolored to one of the other colors. And um, if that new color is no longer in conflict, then this reaction can't happen anymore. Um, so if you initialize the system just with uh, one of these uncolored nodes, um, one, one molecule for each of these um, uncolored nodes everywhere over the graph, um, these coloring, these random coloring reactions will put the graph into some randomly colored state. Um, and uh, then these conflict reactions will keep uncoloring those nodes until there are no more conflict reactions. Um, and that will only happen if the graph is colorable. If, if, if it's not colorable, then this will just keep happening forever. Yeah, so that's um, like you, you could, you can color a graph using a Turing machine. And so in principle, you could do that 
you could do a Turing machine implementation of this, but um, that would be, I think, really horrifically inefficient to something like this, which I think um, uh, naturally exploits. Um, so, so th this sort of um, taking taking an existing state and randomly changing it slightly, that's called stochastic local search, as in um, you're randomly changing, you're, you're exploring the small area around your current state. And I, I think that the stochastic nature of stochastic chemical reactions is, is a real natural fit for something like stochastic local search. So at the end, do you just look at how many molecules of, um, how many of different kinds of molecules are there to figure out what the final yeah, that, that, that's right. So, so if, if you were doing this in real life, um, you would get, um, you know, these, these molecules out and you could just use um, DNA sequencing or something to figure out what these molecules actually are. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, no worries. So is that the case that actually in general, you can solve any uh, constraint satisfaction problem? Yes, that's right. So, so actually, um, a project that I worked on kind of for fun was, um, so, so th this is a, an example of the stochastic local search. Um, it's unbiased and so it's not particularly efficient. And so one of the projects that I worked on um, last summer was thinking about how we can use um, this sort of idea to solve Sudoku, which is um, a different, I mean, that, that's really also just a graph coloring problem. Uh, but yes, in, in principle, any constraint satisfaction problem you can solve this way. Mm, I see, I see. So probably you can also characterize like uh, what kind of uh, problem is easier for like, uh, yeah. Yes. So so I, I think, yeah, I think constraint satisfaction is actually something that um, the chemical reactions are particularly good at. Um, I, something like a decision problem. So the question of, I give you a graph and you tell me, is it colorable? That's not something that this is this system is, is good at. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I constraint satisfaction, stochastic local search, um, and and you can actually think of examples in biology where this happens. So so um, as as uh, I will just go back to showing my PowerPoint, um, an example of um, something that happens in cell division is is cells have some number of chromosomes which need to align on um, the, the 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 center of the cell before it splits in two, and you have these things called centromeres which grow these microtubules to hook up to the centromeres. And this is actually a constraint satisfaction problem that the cell will only divide when every chromosome is connected to exactly one centromere on each side. And so you just randomly get these microtubules growing and hooking up to random um, centromeres until that happens, which, which is, yeah, it kind of exactly like graph coloring. Well, very, very, very uh, mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, quite different way of thinking. Yeah. So, uh, do people have more questions? Or... Actually, I do have a more high-level question. It's like, uh, how about this kind of way of like computational thinking in like chemical reaction, like uh, like uh, influence uh, like chemistry? Like, uh, do people also think computationally about the real chemical reactions they encounter? Yeah, I I don't think so. So I I I think that this this really sort of has yet to um th th this is this is quite a small field um and, and a fairly young field and I, I think it really has yet to 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 find its way into biology and chemistry more generally. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think when when people talk about um computing with chemistry or computing with biology, they 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 tend to think about um informatics, like how can we use big data to understand biological systems or to, to design chemical reactions or something, which is, which is a, you know, a very valuable thing to do, but it's, it's, it's quite different. Mm. Yes. Yes. This is more like a button up and really like a fundamental understanding, but also like a, a different perspective. And mm. do you feel like it has a, a potential? I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel, I definitely feel like that. That's why I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Good. So maybe my last question would then be like, what's your uh, vision on like the future of this field, like in five or 10 years? Mm. Like, as you said, this is a relatively young field. So it potentially very exciting in the next five, 10 years. So what yeah. will be your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, so I, I think when people originally got excited about DNA computing, um, so, so one of the original papers was um, Len Edelman's paper where he showed that you can use real DNA molecules to solve um, this problem called a, a Hamiltonian path problem. Um, and and um, the insight, I won't go into any of the details, but the insight there was just that um, because molecules are so small um, and, and because you can order so many of them and have them in a test tube, when you combine them, they can explore a huge search space, um, possibly um, a bigger search space than um, silicon-based computers at the time were capable of exploring. Um, and so I, I think that Len Edelman and, and some people who originally got excited about DNA computing um, thought that um, on some sorts of real computational problems that DNA computing could be competitive with silicon computing. And I don't think that that's true anymore. Um, a lot of the problems that you care about, the search space is too big to possibly be able to explore all of that space with um, real molecules. Um, it's also slow and expensive to order these strands, to mix them together, to read the outputs. Um, so I, I, I think for computations like that, um, that DNA computing is never going to compete with silicon computing. But I think that the, um, uh, the, the core strength of molecular computing is that it, um, it happens at a very small scale and it can interact with other molecular systems. And so I, I think that um, really the, the, the key applications and the key strengths of this technology are that you can use it to do things like control biological systems um, or to try to build biological systems from scratch. Um, and so, so yeah, what I'm particularly interested in is this question of, of pattern formation. And so my um, research at the moment is trying to design um, what are called reaction diffusion systems. So, so, so this is an example of a reaction diffusion system where you just have um, this chemical reaction network, but rather than thinking about it happening in a well-mixed test tube, you let it happen um, over space. And so you can end up getting these spatial patterns. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in and, and, and what I think that the field can actually do um, is design these molecular programs, um, which when, when they happen in a reaction fusion setting, um, allow you to, to, to form arbitrary, interesting patterns. Um, and, and so I, I think there that something like the question of um, how does uh, a, a, you know, a human body, which is extremely complicated, has tens of trillions of cells, but it grows from just a, a single cell. Um, and its genome is only billions of base pairs long. And so somehow written in the genome is some extremely clever algorithm to explain how you can grow from just this single cell at the beginning to this complex organism at the end. Um, and so I, I think that by studying pattern formation in these chemical systems, we can start to understand maybe what those algorithms are. Um, so that, that's probably what I am most excited about. I see. So it's like a, maybe a way to, to attack like an understanding of like emergence property. Yeah, I, I think so. Mm, I think so. I see. Well, this is really an interesting direction. And I do hope, I mean, in the future, I'll definitely like uh, put an eye on this, uh, this field and even try to maybe have some collaborations. Yeah, that would be great. That would be really great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sounds uh, very exciting. Yeah, but maybe due to time limit, yeah, maybe let's uh, thank uh, Salvador again and I'll end the recording. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.